Ooh, that fart stinks. This podcast is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Spoiler warning for whatever is in the title of this episode. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. Follow Daniel at DStarSick on Twitter. Follow Ryan at Darth Damio on the Bluebird app. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that The Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Welcome to a very special bonus episode of The Horror of Babylon, where we are discussing Reanimator from 1985. I am Ryan, and with me as always is Daniel. Say hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. And thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan, the, the Full Metal, Metal Patron. Patron. And this episode is brought to you specifically by Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, who chose this as one of their bonus episodes because they are at the... $25 tier where they get to two, choose two bonus movie episodes per month and you can visit Poor Horseman Comics and Gaming at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia or at the Mall at Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and say hello, hello to Ronald the Third, Grampus of Christmas and I'm sorry if I'm slurring my words because we are drinking Tropical Beer Hug from Goose Island which is 99, 99% alcohol <laughs> it's 9.9% alcohol we'd be dead <laughs> We'd be, it, what would that be? Drinking rubbing alcohol? I I literally watched an episode of Simpsons where that happened t- yeah. t- today. Uh, but yeah, I don't even know if rubbing alcohol is 99% alcohol. <laughs> I, last summer, I got a cleaning solution on my hands that was like over 90% alcohol and my hands burned for like an hour. That sucks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, go to Four Horse, my comics and gaming, buy some comics. Play some Magic, play some Pokemon, Warhammer, what have you. It's uh, literally the best comic shop I've ever interacted with. Yes, and also if you're a a Middle Earth nut like me, uh, go and pre-order the new Magic Lord of the Rings set. So get on that because that stuff's going to be sought after. I'd probably be shilling for them even if they weren't paying it for us. Yes. (laughs) Okay, so let's talk about uh, Hellraiser. It not much of a trigger warning here if you haven't seen this movie hellraiser hellraiser (laughs) Um, how much of that beer have you had i'm like three-fourths of the way through wow mine's almost gone (laughs) reanimator uh not much of a trigger warning there this movie is pretty bloody and gory but there's a little bit of sexual assault yeah and there's a little bit of sexual (laughs) assault so (laughs) if those trigger you maybe be a little a little cautious with this movie but our discussion of it shouldn't be too triggering so let's jump to our history with reanimator daniel go ahead what when did you see this first i think i was back in college and i was like really into hp lovecraft at the time i bought like this uh what they called it the necronomicon and it was literally just all of his like major stories and the books like this thick i remember it sitting on your coffee table and i was reading it and i read a bunch of those stories and i was like i want to I want to watch H.P. Lovecraft movies, which turned out to be a mistake because most of them suck. Not this one. And uh, I found Reanimator, and I was like, hey, this is basically Evil Dead. This is great. I think it's a little better than Evil Dead in my opinion, but we'll we'll table that for now. Uh, For me, I remember coming home one day, and my brother was watching this, and he was like, he was halfway through, three quarters of the way through or something. I don't even know what scene I saw, but I saw one scene. And I was like, ooh, this looks cool. I should watch this sometime from the beginning. And I left. And, you know, I mentally put it on my to watch list. 
And then never did. And then never did. <laughs> Which is kind of one of my favorite things about having a podcast is forcing myself to find time to watch all these movies. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we get some gems every now and again. Yep. I watched it for the first time a couple days ago for the podcast. I also uh, read the short story prior to watching the movie, and I loved both. Yeah. I, it, it's for of, different reasons. It's one of the few short stories that I know of that H.P. Lovecraft himself didn't like. Yeah. And it's basically because he had to write it for money. Mm. It, it is. It did feel different. Now, I've only read Call of Cthulhu and Herbert West Reanimator. But this story was less cerebral. Yeah. It's less, you know, like, elevated. Th than... There was a lot more uh, editorial notes that he had to deal with. Mm. Makes sense. I think it... Racism aside, it turned out to be a better story. There, there, if you read the short story, there is like, and it's like almost a random segment. Yeah, that if you you could almost completely excise and nothing from the story would be. I think you would, could a hundred percent excise it. Yeah. And it wouldn't affect the story. It wouldn't affect it at all. I mean, it would affect it, and then it would make it less cringy. Yeah. But that aside, yeah, the short story is real good. We might do a bonus episode on the short story at some point. Yeah, I, we might do that as a freebie uh, for Ronald. Yeah, for good old Ronald. The vampires are pure myth, superstition. I may be able to bring you proof that the superstition of yesterday can become the scientific reality of today. Okay, so jumping into background, as you said, this movie is a loosely a loose adaptation of Herbert West Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft. It was directed by Stuart Gordon. Who this, who's done a lot of Lovecraft stuff. Yes, he has. Uh, he also directed Dagon, which we plan on covering later this year. This was his first theatrical film as a director. Okay, see, I didn't know it was his first one. Uh, the screenplay was written by Dennis Powley and William Norris. This is William Norris's only writing credit. He has other film credits, but this is the only one as a writer. Okay. Dennis Pally also wrote From Beyond, Dagon, Ghoulies 2, and Body Snatchers. Uh, Body Snatchers is good. I haven't seen any of the Ghoulies and From Beyond, another H.P. Lovecraft adaptation. The story for how this movie came to be is that uh, Stuart Gordon was having a conversation with friends about vampire movies and he was complaining that there were too many vampire movies, and somebody asked him, hey, have you read H.P. Lovecraft's Herbert West Reanimator? And Stuart Gordon was actually a huge fan of H.P. Lovecraft, but he had not read that one specifically, so he immediately went and read that story and was like, oh my god, this is the movie I have to make. <laughs> now, originally, uh, Stuart Gordon wanted this to be a theatrical stage production that was... Like a, a play? A play. Okay. That was a more true adaptation of the short story. I would have liked to have seen that. Yes. Not that I'm complaining about what we got. And that from there, it evolved to being a half-hour television pilot. Mm -hmm. And the network said, it's not going to really work as a half-hour show. So they made it an hour-long show, and they actually wrote 13 episodes and then from there, it evolved to being a theatrical film, which is what it originally became. Wow. Now, it was actually originally released without a rating, and they had to make an edited version to get it down to an R rating. I think what's available today on like Blu-ray and such is the original like unedited version, but there was an edited version in theaters to get it to an R rating. I, I can... I'll bet you a dollar I know what they cut. <laughs> I actually don't know, so go ahead and, and guess. Uh, the uh, the head going oh. going down on the girl, or trying to. Or I would imagine that's one of the things. They probably had to cut a majority of that scene. Yeah. Um, according, Can you guess what my king is? <laughs> that? <laughs> <Yeah>. that scene. <laughs> uh, according to Dennis Pally... Uh, they did multiple drafts of the script, and the original draft had no humor at all. It was straight. It horror. was just the straight, like a straight adaptation of the. the I, story. I don't know if it was a straight adaptation or probably it, more but, tonally consistent. Yeah, it was just. It was not the and the humor itself came out with revisions and more so like actually on the set 
as they were filming. Like seeing what the actors were doing. Yeah. Uh, so if you haven't seen this, I, I'd really classify it as more of like a horror horror comedy, like a tongue in cheek. I always comedy. compare it to Evil Dead. Yeah. I say it's in that kind of vein of horror. I think Evil Dead Two feels like a really good comparison. E especially Evil Dead Two. Yeah. It's not exactly the same vein, but like if you like Cabin in the Woods, you'll probably like something like this. Yeah. It had a budget of in the range of 900,000 to 1.3 million, and it took in about 2 million, so... so it, that's not great. Yeah, I mean, it kind of mixed. It, but I, it has a huge cult following these days. Yeah, it's considered a cult classic, and I, get, I think in... Today, you know, there's... People spend more on promoting movies. Yeah. So you have to get a higher multiplier if you're a budget to consider it to be successful, and that wasn't as true back then, but still you still have to make at least double. It probably at best broke even. Yeah. Uh, and this, and I didn't know this until I was writing the outline for this episode. It spawned a series. There are two yeah, sequels. Yeah, there's two sequels. Bride of Reanimator <laughs> from 1990 and Beyond Reanimator in 2003. Ryan, are we going to watch them? <laughs> I love this movie, and I, lo I, I, I love the short story. I actually haven't seen these, so they would be fresh for both of us. I think we have to do it, especially <laughs> if Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming orders that as their next two episodes. So uh, we'll we'll see what they say. Um, hopefully, they do that rather than some more uh, like Valerian and stuff. So I don't. I mean, I kind of liked what we got out of Valerian in terms of it, comedy. It was a good episode, and I had fun watching it with you. Yeah, it, that's a. If we get more stuff like that, we'll have to watch them together. Yeah, but I, I would not have been particularly happy watching it by myself. <laughs> it, at least it's pretty. Yeah. Like I, all right, we're not here <laughs> we're to moving talk. on. We're not here to no talk more. about Valerian. Valerian. And that's that. Another story in the classic, infallible three-act structure. Good enough for Aristotle, good enough for The Simpsons. Mr. Sislak, I have a feeling there's going to be one more act to this story. Well, I'm not hanging around for that. Four rags. Okay, structure and themes, Valerian. Uh, so I have two things under structure and themes. First, I want to talk about it as an adaptation of the short story, and then I also want to talk about it comparing it to Frankenstein. So in terms of an adaptation of the story itself, what are your thoughts? Um, I wouldn't say it's particularly good, but it doesn't exactly spit in the face of the source material, if that makes sense. I feel like... It, with adaptations, you either want to be super true or you want to take the core ideas of the story and do your own thing. And I felt like they took the core idea. They, I felt like they had the spirit of the story. Yeah. And maybe not necessarily like the tone, even though I think that story is a lot funnier than like a lot of other H.P. Lovecraft stories. And yeah. I call it pulpy. Yeah, it's very pulpy. And, uh, but they took a lot of like certain plot beats like the headless zombie. Yes. Um, the, the, the mysterious serum, uh, Herbert West's obsession. Like, the character Herbert West himself is pretty much Herbert West. Yeah. The the character... So, Herbert West from the movie is, is basically the same as he is in the story. Dan, who is unnamed in the story, he's the narrator from the story, is very... is changed a lot, but we'll get to that when we get to characters. Yeah. Um, I think... It's a good adapta adaptation in terms of themes, but not a very good adaptation in terms of plot. Yeah. But I think I would probably it call worked. it something like a C plus in terms of adaptation. Yeah. I've seen way worse. I've seen a oh, little yeah. better. Yeah. Maybe B minus even. I would say it's even more of like a a homage, a, a homage, or a kind is, of is a it, reboot, or yeah. Is, is it pronounced homage? Homa I mean, I think it's tomato, tomato. I I pronounce word wrong all the time. I'm okay being corrected as long as I... And I, I normally don't help. don't even correct you because I just like to, to hear you talk. <laughs> I don't even think I said anything about Tom Curry for like six episodes. Well, I do it on purpose now. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then Frankenstein... So, to me, as I was reading the story and watching the movie, to me, if I could summarize the the story of Reanimator in one word, it would be Frankenstein, if, if uh, Victor Frankenstein gave even less of, of a, a fuck. fuck. <laughs> yeah, it, it was Frankenstein if he didn't stop being obsessed. Victor is a questionable person at best. I yeah. think somebody with good intentions who made bad decisions, but Herbert West 
is not a good good person. I, I would say Herbert West is the Nazi scientist who just wants to see what he can get away with. He's Sheldon Cooper. If Sheldon Cooper chose like a medical path, yeah. <laughs> if he was in uh, experimental medicine instead of uh, physics, physics, yeah, exactly. He's like, yeah, kill the dogs. Who gives a fuck? I'll get answers. <laughs> It's just a dog. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's his personality in this movie. It, and it's funny because uh, his roommate, Dan, <laughs> is very put upon and is very much like Leonard yeah. Hofstetter. Yeah. All right. And, and the actor just plays it so straight. Yeah. He could have played this character in an actual horror movie. Like, I feel like his performance wouldn't have changed in between them. No. But when you play it with certain music and against other types, it comes across as super funny. There, there, you could direct this differently and edit it differently to, to not be a comedy. Yeah. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Let's jump to characters. Let's talk about Herbert West, who's played by Star Trek legend Jeffrey Coombs. Who Coombs. Is, Coombs. Who is... <laughs> Like one of the best character actors out there. He's great. I did not even recognize him until I was uh, literally researching this. I was like, oh my God, he's been like six different iconic Star Trek characters. This is so cool. Uh, but, and he's also much younger in this movie than he was when he was in Star Trek. Regular. This was one of his earlier works, wasn't it? Um, let's look. I, I love that we just go to IMDb and learn stuff along the way. Yeah. I mean, you got to learn. Who, who was he in? It was Samuel Stearns. I don't know who that is. Okay. I'm going to have to rewatch our Some Ideas Here. I've just been to wanting to. It's great. Is it on Disney Plus? I don't know. Holy shit. He's been in so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's he's in the sequel. He's in Bride of Reanimator. Uh, yeah. Uh, Herbert West just comes back is the only thing I know. The first thing he was in was in Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch. Okay, so it was like... It was relatively early. Pretty early in his career. Not his first... But he was also in From Beyond, which is also a Stuart... Which is also a Stuart Gordon movie. It's another Lovecraft adaptation. Okay. Well, maybe we'll cover that as well. Yeah. Okay, so just general thoughts on Herbert West. Uh, a plus. He's S tier. He's... In terms of, like, horror protagonist slash anti-heroes slash protagonist like, there's lots of things you could list this guy yeah as. like semi-villains like yeah he he's iconic people like reference this guy all the time i think he proves that your protagonist can not be like lawful good yeah and still be entertaining and He's chaotic neutral at best. Yeah, I, I think chaotic neutral is a good description because for him. he's literally just doing whatever he needs to to find out how his serum works. Yeah, I want to find. It's the same thing with the story. Like, how did you come across this? <laughs> but that's part of the fun is like not knowing. Yeah, and exactly. the more you explain, the worse it would get. Yeah, exactly. Um, he he was just immediately when he's introduced to Dr. Carl Hill, who's like... <laughs> he's so antagonistic. He's so antagonistic. And I, I hate to keep bringing up Big Bang Theory, but he just really, really reminded me of Sheldon Cooper. Just, aren't, aren't you the plagiarist? <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> like, could you imagine going up to your college professor going, hey, I know about your plagiarism. <laughs> I would not have done that. Um, but... Not only because, you know, I'm a pretty polite person. Okay, uh, so next up, uh, Dan... Harmon? <laughs> no. <laughs> Dan Kane, played by Bruce Abbott. I also thought he did a great job. As an performance. Yeah. Yeah, I thought Bruce Abbott did a pretty good job. As an adaptation of the unnamed narrator. I thought it was pretty poor. Yeah. Um, I understand that they were probably thinking... We need to have a character who isn't like an asshole. We need we need to have someone who's not completely amoral so that someone can so that the average moviegoer can latch onto them. But I kind of liked that in the short story that Dan's character, who is the narrator, like you said, yeah. was completely complicit in everything Herbert West did. He just kind of went along with it. He's like, oh, I wanna see what happens. He's just <laughs> as guilty as Herbert was. And at the end of the story, spoiler alert, he fucking gets away with it. He's just like, well, he didn't invent the serum. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he did everything Herbert Everything did. else, yeah. yeah. He's, he's just like, yeah, I kind of want to see if this works. So this adaptation of the character was kind of disappointing, but I can understand that they didn't 
it's a pretty reasonable Hollywood change. Yeah. Uh, I also thought it was really funny that his first reaction was to go to a professor and went, Herbert can reanimate the dead. <laughs> I should just go and tell the truth. Like, <laughs> like, if you showed me that you invented a serum, or if I showed you that I invented a serum that I could completely reanimate the dead, would you tell anybody? No. Because no one would believe you. Okay, so, <laughs> preview. Soon we're going to be uh, covering... Ringu by Koji Suzuki. I 100% am bringing up our friendship in it. <laughs> That's fine. Because I, I also uh, felt like Asakawa and Ryuji were similar. To <laughs> That's not what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> so, just a preview of my Koontz for that episode. My Koontz <laughs> is that the, the main character, Asakawa tells like three or four people that he's going to die in a week because he watched a videotape <laughs> and every single character believes him. And they all believe him because they're like I could watch the tape <laughs> but I'm not going to. But that's just a risk. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, fair. I wouldn't watch the tape either. But they all just, without any real kind of fight, they believe him. My, my favorite one is his like editor going, can you at least get a story out of this? <laughs> Uh, but it, this is, reanimator is the opposite where you know the logical thing happens where Dan goes straight to the professor and the professor's like you're full of shit man you're expelled you're expelled oh that scene was hard to watch yeah. I was like are you banging my daughter <laughs> I wanted to punch that dean so bad it was like Animal House all over again I love Animal House <laughs> Animal House is great um, I was like oh that that dean is the worst and then. After everything that happens to the Dean, I was kind of like, uh, maybe he wasn't so bad. Maybe he didn't deserve all of this. He didn't deserve to be turned into a zombie and then lobotomized. Okay, so uh, let's move on. And speaking of the studio probably forcing things to happen into the movie, let's talk about Megan, uh, who was played by Barbara Crampton, who she she did a decent job. I thought the performance was not bad. Would you would you like to hear a piece of movie trivia about this? Yes, I would. Okay, uh, so she took her boyfriend to the premiere of this movie, and when the uh, getting going down on by a zombie head happened in, in in the theater, her boyfriend stood up and screamed, "This is what you do!" <laughs> and stormed out. I mean. <laughs> I'm not going to defend that guy, <laughs> but I probably would have said something ahead of That's, time. I, um, I'm a uh, big fan of a uh, a YouTuber called Good Bad Flicks who did an exploring series on this where he tells you a bunch of like behind-the-scenes nonsense and trivia. But that's the only bit of trivia that sticks in my memory because I can 100% picture it in my head. <laughs> if I didn't know ahead of time and I knew my girlfriend was in a movie and I saw that... I don't know that I would scream and storm out of the theater, but I probably would have been taken aback. I, I might have been a little uncomfortable. Um, I I would not have screamed and stormed out. That's like that's a childish, very childish. Reaction. Granted, by this point in my life, I've dated two strippers, so I'm a little bit more open than I used to be. Right. So I, I you know that yeah, I mean, your girlfriend's an actress. These things happen happen in movies. On the other hand, if I were uh, Barbara Crampton, I might have warned, hey, like, I have some nude scenes in this movie. You're gonna see some weird shit happen. I literally movie. get paid more if I put my tits out. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I thought she did a, a pretty decent job. Yeah. Uh, the character itself, I definitely kind of viewed as, like, a a studio insert. Like, we need... We need a woman in the movie. We need kind of a, a romance subplot. People won't watch if they can't connect. <laughs> Honestly, it's the whole reason that Guillermo del Toro's Lovecraft movie doesn't get made because he has a script. He's ready. But every studio has said, hey, we need you to add a romance subplot. And he says, no, that's not in the story. <laughs> I have uh, I have a fan theory. That's why he uh, didn't end up doing the, the Hobbit movies. Because he he wouldn't um, be okay with it. adding the elf character. Yeah, ex well, maybe not so much adding her character, but oh, but like making the romance subplot. Yeah, exactly. Because that's not the point of the story. That's my per that's my personal theory as to why the project was handed from him to Peter Jackson. Okay, that uh, that makes sense. I don't know if it's true. That's also my least favorite part of those movies. 
I like it. I think it fits the themes because a huge theme of, of Tolkien's stories are that uh, cross-species romance between uh, humans and elves. And this is just the same thing, but elves and dwarves. And it's a little bit more meaningful because historically dw- elves and dwarves are enemies. However, I definitely, like somebody who hasn't read all the books, I can definitely understand that. I just wanted more dragon. Yeah. Okay. All, right. <laughs> all right. We're not here to talk about the Hobbit movies. Uh, but <laughs> You'll go on all night. Uh, so, but I kind of thought this character worked in the movie. On paper, I might have said, no, don't add this romantic subplot. I thought she did a great job. Yeah. I thought she, was a gr- she did a great performance. And I thought the character actually worked in the movie because the the last like the third act was all based on her being in peril and the third act is like the most over the top part of it and none of that would have been possible without her character it also kind of brings up a very like a moral quandary right at the end of the movie and this episode is sponsored by blue moon not Belgian. really not really <laughs> but you can always sponsor us yeah blue moon reach out we will we will accept a sponsorship for as little as ten dollars. If we ever get this podcast like really off the ground, I'm going to reach out to Bad Dragon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll be like, I will show you every episode. Um, all right. Uh, so our next character is Doctor Carl Hill, played <laughs> by David Gale, who is the scummiest horror villain. And like he he's got to be like in the top twenty scummiest horror villains out there. The man gives uh, giving head a whole new meaning. Oh. <laughs> he wants to get a head in his field. <laughs> he's ahead of the curve. So, just the <laughs> basic level, he's that scummy academic who like plagiarizes other people's work and takes advantage of it. He also reminded me of that one professor uh, from Frankenstein who told Frankenstein he's stupid. Yeah. Yeah, he did. I don't Even though Frankenstein clearly knows what he's doing because he creates life. And that may have been the original uh, inspiration for... Well, I mean... Like Car- in the short story? In the short story, yeah. Uh, so adding on top of that scummy academic character, he's also just like a secret pervert who's obsessed with this woman who's like 40 years his junior and he's me in the future <laughs> and i know like she's 18 oh okay never mind my, technically i mean she's a college student my, my cutoff age is 21 now oh my god uh, <laughs> so technically there legally there's nothing explicitly wrong with their relationship but if you're like keeping a seat. There's a certain power dynamic that's not great here. Exactly. And also, the fact that you're keeping, like, this secret manila folder with, you know, like, strips of her hair. Oh, it's so weird. <laughs> it's I love it. It's so creepy. And you're, you're using the fact that her father is going through this horrible medical issue to leverage yourself into a position of power over her to try and get her to come to you at in sympathy like it's completely disgusting you're trying to get him to uh uh coom to you (laughs) i mean carl hill is is like the worst and also how the hell did he get back to his office as a headless body carrying a head in a tray without anybody seeing anything (laughs) with the mannequin head on top and that's 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 the next thing okay so after he gets decapitated at dan and herbert's house the headless body just carries the head in a tray back to his office. And then when he goes to the hospital, then he has the mannequin yeah, head. Yeah, because he mask- first he has to find a mannequin head. Well, he had it in his office. Oh, yeah. Because he has the uh, the dissecting or the... Uh, yeah. The medical dummy. Yeah. But, like, I know that's, like, willing suspension of disbelief. But, like, what? <laughs> that always cracks me up. I know. <laughs> and that's why the, this movie... I don't think this movie would work if it wasn't a comedy. Yeah. But, I mean, Carl. Fucking Carl. I love this performance. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, no, David Gale yeah. did an awesome job. I, I love... I'd let him go down on me. <laughs> I would not. <laughs> um, I love the fact that when the headless body takes the head out of the duffel bag when they get to the morgue, he's, like, gasping for air, like, oh, I couldn't breathe. I'm like, you don't have fucking lungs. <laughs> you're, you're just a head. What the hell? 
I need blood in this tray. That was gross. <laughs> this movie's kind of gross. It, it is very gory. I watched this while eating lunch. <laughs> I don't recommend that. Did and, you have Chinese food? Did you have noodles in your mouth? No, pizza pockets. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> um, and I'm not really, like, my stomach doesn't get easily turned. I, I'm pretty desensitized, but even I, like, thought twice about eating. I kept eating. I didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't really recommend this movie while eating. No, not at all. And it's definitely, like, in that, like, 80s horror, like, super graphic practical effects kind of, like, yeah. Uh, Dawn of the Dead kind of... It's very Dawn of the dead with its gore. Yeah. Uh, and the last character I wanted to talk about was Dean Halsey, played by Robert Sampson. Uh, you are spelled. Great, great performance. The guy, he nails that, like, 80s college dean dick. Robot house! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, was, I was already thinking about including Robot House there. But, like, the Revenge of the Nerds, Animal House, yeah. just like, oh my god, this guy is such a knob. I, uh... I, I also loved his performance as the zombie. <laughs> yes, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny how he so quickly became your least favorite character to such like a sympathetic character as soon as he became a zombie. Yeah. You're like, oh, I feel so bad for him. He's like cowering in the corner of the padded room. Poor guy. And then he gets his, uh, what's it called where they fuck with your brain? Lobotomy. A lobotomy. Yeah. I was like, oh, he he got a little lobotomy with a little laser, you know the, laser uh, drill. You know the person who invented the lobotomy got a Nobel Peace Prize? What? Or a Nobel Scientific Prize? What? the fuck yeah yeah that's fucked up yeah i mean kissinger also got a nobel peace prize so. henry kissinger <laughs> is one of my favorite historical figures he not because i admire him but just because yeah, he's, no. he's so interesting I, he is interesting yeah but he got a nobel peace prize i'll kill you all <laughs> i'll drive you crazy and i'll kill you all i'm every nightmare you ever had I am your worst dream come true. I'm everything you ever were afraid of. Scary shit. Uh, is Reanimator scary? Uh, I don't think so. I don't even think I found it scary the first time I watched it. I don't think I would have found it scary as a kid. I I definitely find it gross and shocking. Yeah, it's it's gross. I'm even having a hard time thinking that I would have found this scary as a kid, unless like. Yeah, unless you find the idea of zombies themselves like scary, I the scariest thing about zombies for me is being eaten alive. And they really kind of don't do that. No, in, in this movie, the zombies just kind of like beat you up, which is less scary. Yeah, which works because it's a comedy. Yeah, um, because they didn't eat people in the short story either. They no, they were just reanimated. However, the short story I did find to be very scary. And like I said, we Especially might Especially when they're dragged he's dragged off at the end. That <laughs> the scariest part for me of the short story and we might do it its own episode at some point. But there's a part in the short story where they reanimate a very tall man. <laughs> and I'm not going to get into specifics, but the the that person comes to their house in the middle of the night and is just violently shaking the screen door at the back of their house and it wakes them up and that that part is actually pretty scary i think that if a six foot tall person was shaking my back door in the middle of the night and i know that he was like reanimated i'd piss myself Let's jump to Kiss Me Fat Boy. <laughs> and I literally, I knew we had to do Kiss Me Fat Boy, but I didn't even know what to put. Like, well, you have uh, fucking the Dean's daughter, which I would never recommend. No. Um, no. And, unless it's like the Dean's daughter of a school you don't go to. Yeah, I mean, even then, I've seen enough college movies to know that it's generally a bad idea. It's like fucking your boss's daughter. Y yeah. You are 100% trapped at that point. Completely. Um. Then you got the, the zombie head going down on her, or trying to. You know, 
I'll try and describe this to you, but so so that was about the last thirty ish minutes of the movie. Yeah. And I was already like Oh hey Leonard. Uh Executive I, producer. He's here. I, I was already like really appreciating the movie like an hour into it was this movie is actually like really good pretty great isn't yeah, it yeah I thought it was great I didn't want to like uh, impose my views on the movie on you no I appreciate you <laughs> letting me form my own opinions but and then the last like 20 to 30 minutes happened and I'm like what oh, the boy. actual fuck and it takes a lot <laughs> I'm super desensitized it takes a lot to shock me it kind of jumps the shark yeah it super jumps the shark it, it is the uh the Henry Winkler of of horror movies. The, the only way I've been able to rationalize it is the zombies kind of become a super impulse. Yeah. And what's this guy's impulse? He's obsessed with a super young chick. Oh, so yeah. of course he's and uh, you know becoming the best at whatever. So of course he's going to focus on her and focus on stealing the formula, where other zombies might focus on violence or not knowing what's going on. And it, it just goes to prove that he's a bullshit academic, as Herbert West says. Like, you have all of this knowledge, and you use it to go down on this girl. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I mean, I probably would do the same thing because I'm a total horn dog. But. I'm also... I, I, again, I'm known as the serial workplace dater at this point, so... Yeah, you're a man whore, for sure. I wish I could go back in time 10 years ago and be like, Daniel's a total man whore. <laughs> like, Everyone be like, would be no like, way. what? <laughs> You're full of There's shit. There's no way. You're totally full of shit. What do you mean he dated two strippers? That's that's the lie. That's a lie. <laughs> two, like, AI strippers. Are, are those strippers in Mass Effect? <laughs> you full <of> shit. <laughs> Thank you, divorce. <laughs> ah! Oh, my God. Are you Stephen King? No, I'm Dean Koontz. Oh. King and Koontz, what is your king for Rian? My king is the zombie going down on the girl. My but, king is Herbert West. Yeah. I, he is an A-tier actor. Jeffrey Coombs, uh, and it's hard to like pick a favorite Star Trek character because he's done so many good ones. I mean, Wei Yun from Deep Space Nine is probably the most iconic, but I, I love his Andorian from Star Trek Enterprise. My favorite is still probably William Shatner. Yes, William yeah. Shatner is also very good. But yeah, I mean, uh, Her uh, Jeffrey Coombs as Herbert West just totally sells I this can't movie. picture anyone else in that role now. No, I cannot. Um, You know who could maybe, like if they remade this movie, who could maybe do that? Like, Sheldon Cooper? Like, <laughs> Jim Parsons. <laughs> Jim Parsons could definitely do it, but I was thinking Benedict Cumberpatch. Probably. He yeah. could probably do it. Yeah. I, I mean, I hate this term, but like, Probably a method actor, someone I would pick. Yeah. Somebody who, like, gets super obsessed with shit and probably would read the short story, like, 50 fucking times. Yeah. And be super argumentative on set. Hmm. Someone on the... Uh, like Gary Oldman. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, or... He's too old. He's too old. Yeah, he's too old. He, he'd be the... He'd be the head. <laughs> yeah, he'd be the, the Carl Hill. Okay, uh... And then your coots for Reanimator. It's really hard for me to pick a Coons because I feel like a lot of my Coonses would be like super nitpicky. Uh, yeah. Like, a maybe there was a joke here or there that fell like a little flat, but even like the worst jokes in this movie, I think are better jokes than some jokes in most movies we go see together. Yeah. Um, maybe not like cocaine bear levels, but still no. pretty decent. Let me think of something. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that my Coons... It, it it's not too much of a coons because of where all the movie works as it is. Yeah. But it's uh Dan, the narrator from the short story. I wish he was a little more amoral than he is in the movie. Yeah. Like, but, um, and that's kind of nitpicky, but I, I would like it to be like because I think it works as is. Yeah. And sometimes Lovecraft is hard to adapt. And I don't think I would change it. But, but like I would like it maybe like a hair closer to the source material. Yeah. Not not like a, a direct adaptation, but like five percent. Get like five percent closer is probably what I would ask for. Yeah, something like that. I I completely agree. Okay, so let's move to ranking. I've just noticed that we always drink on Ronald's episodes. We do, <laughs> because we have to. Thank you, Ronald Grampus. 
Did we have a homework for this? We did, but I'm trying to find our rankings. Oh, yeah, rankings. Oh, this is going to be hard. I, I did mine ahead of time. Let me see where you put yours. Okay, so I put mine as my new number... My new number eight. That's pretty good. It's below Nosferatu and above The Mist. I don't know if I necessarily think it's a better movie than The Mist, but the the thing with The Mist is, like, watching it stresses me out so bad. <laughs> I don't necessarily enjoy watching it, even though I think it's maybe... Uh, that's perfectly fair. Yeah. My only counter to that is I like being stressed out by horror movies, and it does its job. <laughs> I like being stressed out by horror movies to an extent. <laughs> yeah. But when the thing that's stressing me out is the death of a child... Yeah. It's like the exact reason I can't finish reading Cujo because I keep picturing my stepson. We are going to cover Cujo. <laughs> yeah. We are going to do You're going to make me get through it. When Rattlesnakes comes out... We'll we're do them do back to back. We're doing Cujo. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's below Nosferatu um, and above It's a pretty mist. good ranking. I, I, I like that ranking. Um, <laughs> trying to copy and paste it with a little bit of alcohol in your system. A little bit. <laughs> You you're went all the way half. down to half. You're not half, you're Daniel. I'm uh, going to assume it's in your top half. It's definitely in my top half. Right below Dracula 1992. It, maybe right above it. Um, I definitely like Nosferatu more. Let's go right below Dracula 1992 because that shaped my sexuality. Okay, so that makes it your new... Wait a Jesus, this is hard. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's both of our number eight. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and also, is Nosferatu is both of our number sevens. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we have the same. Oh no, wait, it's your six and my seven. It's still pretty close. Pretty close. Oh my god. <laughs> um, we should, when we're done recording, let's watch Nosferatu and scream like little girls and see if we can wake up my kids. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they would love that. No, yeah. I don't know if I would love Beck kicking both of our asses, but I don't, I don't, actually, that might be kind of hot. <laughs> We're not allowed to drink beer. Bear hug again. <laughs> Jesus Christ! If we do, we need to start earlier. Yeah. Homework. You have Herbert West's serum. What do you do? I use it on the first thing I can find. Wow, you're. So creative. <laughs> yeah. It, it's like if you gave me the death note, I would immediately just see if it actually works. Remember that. <laughs> yeah. Because I have a death note thing for our ring episode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll just leave it alone for now. Okay. Uh, so if I had Herbert West's uh, formula, fire of uh, serum, what I would do is I would save it for when a pet dies. <laughs> and then I would get another 10 years out of that cat. <laughs> I might use it on a uh, politician just to be super funny. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. I, I would I would resurrect her and go, hey, look what happened. <laughs> I, would, I would reanimate RBG. Yeah. And we could call her RRBG, reanimated Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Can you imagine Kanye West as Batman? He'd have like the little visors with the like the lines. He'd be like, "I'm Batman, yo! I fucked Rihanna," <laughs> or or was it K Kardashian? It was the Kardashian. Yeah, Kim Kardashian. Ha cha cha cha, ha cha cha. Rusty Shackleford. Okay, we need to finish up. All right, our question for the listeners: Have you <coughs> have you seen Reanimator? Do you like it? Have you seen the movie and read the short story? What, what other H.P. Lovecraft uh, would you like? We have loose plans to cover Dagon and At the Mountain of Madness. What are some other stuff you'd like to see? Because we, we definitely need to do more Lovecraft content. I would especially like if anyone suggested like maybe something a little out of the way. Something like, uh, here's one that's a little underappreciated. Yeah, because I was... I did not expect Herbert West Reanimator to be my next Lovecraft story. I would have expected it to be Dagon at the Mountains of Madness or, or Shadow of Sha Ensmith. Shadow over Ensmith. End's mouth. End's mouth. Yeah. Put it in my mouth. Put it in my mouth. Henry, do you want to put it in my mouth? I'm always corrected on which way to pronounce it, and I'm always wrong. I would think it's Ensmith, but I don't know. I believe it might be End's mouth, because I say Ensmith a lot. And they're like, it's mouth, Daniel. God, put it in my mouth, Henry. Um, 
So further reading, if you like Reanimator, Evil Dead, Evil Dead, Evil Dead Two, Ash versus Evil Dead, Cabin in the Woods, something that leans more comedy, because this is definitely tongue in cheek. I've seen Evil Dead, I've seen Evil Dead Two, and I've seen the the remake that came out a, a handful of years ago. Yeah, I've never seen Army of Darkness. Army of Darkness leans even further into comedy. Yeah, I. The way it was always described to me is Evil Dead is horror, Evil Dead 2 is horror comedy, and then Army of Darkness is just comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Ash vs. the Evil Dead is kind of like a homage to all of it. Mm. I actually think it's the best out of all of it, but mostly just because it has fun with the premise. And I think Bruce Campbell's best movie is Sky High. I also agree with that, so... Super good. It's the best My Hero Academia. I think Sky High blows My Hero Academia out of the fucking water. Yeah. It also blows a lot of X-Men out of the water. I mean, I would like to disagree, but there's so much X-Men out there that that has to be true. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like, there has to be a lot of bad runs, right? There is a lot of bad X-Men, but there's also a lot of brilliant X-Men. Uh, you, we should... you, you want to see Daniel actually like Brian Michael Bendis for a change? Give me his X Men books. Yeah, I <laughs> I love uh, his uh, Ultimate X Men, but uh, House of M. House of M is also great. Yeah, yeah. All right, Daredevil, but that's not X Men. But I haven't Daredevil read that. Run is good. I'm sure it's good. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, upcoming on the Horror of Babylon. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure when we're posting this, so I'm not. Things un- are going to come up. Uh, we talked about Ring tonight. Eventually, we'll review Ring. <laughs> yeah, our next kind of big projects after so after the Dracula stuff, we're going to do River of Teeth, which uh, the Hippo book, and then after that, our our two big projects are Ring You and Pet Cemetery. Yeah, yeah. And Lolita is after that, right? I don't know. Okay, I know I downloaded it. Yeah, the uh, the audio book's pretty good. Um, all right. So thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, <laughs> Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan. The Full Metal Patron. The Full Metal Patron. <laughs> we did that at the same time, right? Yeah. All right. Good job, us. <laughs> and thank you to Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming for sponsoring this episode. This, again, Reanimator was chosen by our $25 tier patron for Horseman Comics and Gaming who gets to choose two bonus movie episodes per month. So you can thank them for this. Visit them at Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, at the Mall of Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and say hello to uh, the head criminal Ratigan, uh, also known as <laughs> Ronald the Third Crips. I like Ratigan. 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 Rontigan, the, the, the Moriarty of Rats. That's pretty great. We are not allowed to drink I, beer hug again. I can't wait till we get a fourth patron so we come up with another nickname. <laughs> another <laughs> title. <sighs> okay. Uh, thank you for watching don't, Rain don't, Manor and recording with me. Donate to our Patreon just so I can give you a title. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, stay tuned for our socials and stay scary. Stay scary, everybody. Uh, Where's my coffee? <laughs> And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. Follow Daniel at DStarSick on Twitter. Follow Ryan at Darth Damio on the Bluebird app. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that The Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Stay scary.